The 100% Wild Podcast is brought to you by Onyx Hunt, the nation's number one GPS hunting app. Download today in the Google Play and App Store. Hey, hunting junkies, and welcome back to another episode of the Jury Outdoors 150% Wild Podcast. That's right. We got a 50% extra guest here today. First time First ever. time ever. We're 100 some podcasts in, and we finally nailed down Taylor Drury to be in studio with us for the podcast today. Welcome, we did Taylor. it. I'm here. Thank you. This I'm is glad awesome. to be here. I yeah. like it. Yeah. So you're obviously living out in Utah. You're yep. married. To, uh, <laughs> you're married now. Yeah. Yes. So married woman. It, yeah. What's it like? Everything's changed or nothing's changed. Yep. I feel like some has changed, but still, obviously, I feel like I see you guys every day because we talk so much, Mm -hmm. but I love it. Utah's good. Married life's good. I can't complain. Good deal. You got out and did quite a bit of turkey hunting this spring, didn't you? I did. We had a good season. We did uh, Missouri, Iowa, and then Nebraska. We finished it off in Nebraska, which is just so much fun with dad and Austin. Mm. Sweet. Yep. We were jealously watching the footage. Yeah, we, <laughs> roll yeah. Oh, dang it. <laughs> we watched from afar. Yeah. Someone has to be at the studio. Like, oh, they're going live again. They're going to kill something work. else. L- like- literally there towards the end, like every time they went live, I found myself, you know, because usually I don't necessarily watch all of it. Sure. But yeah. towards the end, it's like I was getting pretty jealous. It's like, all right. I got to <laughs> Now what are they this. doing? The yes. hunts kept getting better and better. What's and- going to die next? Yeah. So get sucked in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Congratulations on a great turkey season thank you you kind of made up for mine oh okay sorry (laughs) sorry (laughs) yeah so we got you in studio it's of course here we're here towards the end of june this probably air in july but we got you in studio we're doing some critical mass shooting we got the podcast i'm killing the kitchen kitchen. stuff and then of course what your day job here with us we're going over all of the social media the deliverables all of our plan for the fall so we got a busy two week or busy two days rather but first we got a pretty awesome guest today. Yes. Yeah. I'm excited. We've got a a fellow Illinois boy that's joining us via Skype, the slack master himself, Mr. Tim Wells. That's right. What's up, Tim? You got me out of bed a little early. Holy cow. It's like nine 30 in the morning here. Still to get his curlers out. (laughs) Same for Taylor. Yep. Same. (laughs) So what's up, man? What's going on? Hey, just keeping it honest, man. Let's not start any rumors or anything stupid, you know, but uh, hey, congratulations. I heard she's pregnant, so you brought her in on the show. That's a good deal. Hey, that's right out of the gates. It took zero time. I was immediately, when I turned to like, he's going to say something. <laughs> okay, no rumors. I'm not pregnant. Nope. That's awesome. That's the way I like to start. Oh, it's great. So it's okay. She uh, she gets teased all the time. So I'm gonna, she's not here, so I'll have to pick on you. That's right. Yeah. So, so Tim's got a daughter that's, I think the same age as you, right? I or roughly somewhere the same in there? Age. I just turned 24. No, no. She's a few years, a couple years younger, but younger. Sydney is, uh, she's still in schools. So okay. she's, she hasn't embarked on marriage and all the other fun stuff, but she, uh, she's doing well right now. She's trying to get through school and become a nurse anesthetist. So I'm pretty proud of her. Awesome. Once in a while we get to hunt together still. Tim, what kind of father are you when Sydney brings home a boyfriend? <laughs> I imagine a tough one. <laughs> Do you have have you ever seen that movie, uh, uh, 300? Yeah. 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 It's, you know, you can envision the attack scene. That's kind of <laughs> that she can date when she's 40 after that, Sounds you know, fair. until then, you know, uh, I think my last, uh, Instagram post was me holding up a pair of, uh, uh, white tail testicles and saying for all you boys uh, interested in Sydney, just bear in mind. And that was the post. So <laughs> <laughs> words to live by for all the fathers of daughters. Yeah. <laughs> Tim's Take the guy Instagram. you want to follow. <laughs> yeah. right. well, well, and and you mean it because you just got done giving it to a grizzly bear up in Alaska, right? Yeah, yeah. You want to inquire about Sydney? You know, I, you know, I kill things for a living. So come on over. We will start the interview. <laughs> And, you know, we were, before we jumped on and started recording, we were just talking briefly, you know, prior to the podcast. And he was I was asking how close he has to get, you know, and how close was he to that bear? And he was saying five steps, five steps, five yards. Doesn't matter. It's pants close. pooping distance. <laughs> That's right. Too close for me. <laughs> too close for comfort. <laughs> Pretty amazing, Tim. So what? So so you were um, out how many days before you had that? chance. Uh, 
Yeah, well, I've spent a couple years after the the Grizzly. It's been a bucket list of mine that uh, I wanted to get with a spear. And I was there last year for uh, close to 15 days. And then I on my 27th day this year, I finally got it done. And, uh, man, I can tell you it was quite a rush. When I seen that bear finally finish into five yards, uh, you know, that doesn't even wrap up the story when you when you talk about it there because the history of me and the bear just trying to get that close. Other encounters I've had when I'm caribou hunting or moose hunting and had bears right in there so close I could smell their breath, it's like – Finally, I got to take that spear and do what I wanted to do with it. And it was a it was a rush. Let me tell you, man, he was literally close enough. I could smell his breath. Oof. That's so, insane. <laughs> so when you're doing that, when you're spear hunting, especially with an animal that size, are you need the exact right angle or, you know, the, the amount of precision that it takes, I assume, so that y- no, you make a good not. shot. W- what goes no. into that? Not that way at all with a spear. And that's the perception that everybody a lot of times won't try to spear just because they think, oh, it's so hard. The, the, it's totally the opposite, tell you the truth. With a whitetail, if you shoot him and you, you know, with your bow and you hit him behind the, uh, right behind the hip or something, you know, you put it through the paunch, you're like, stressed out and we may never see this footage again or because you're afraid you're going to lose them same with a gun you take a you know muzzle or for example you're shooting through the punch that's not a good thing mm-hmm. you run the, my spear anywhere in that animal between the front legs and the back legs and i guarantee you you're going to recover the animal the, the 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 shot has just started when you spear an animal when he comes under me if i can get that spear somewhere between the front legs and the back legs in that animal Animal. When he takes off running, you've got seven feet inside this animal with a blade that's three, four, five times longer than your broadhead, and it's razor sharp on both sides. When he takes off running, the end of that spear is hitting limbs. He rolls on the ground. When I speared that big brown, I hit him good. Obviously, I try to put it through the ribs, but mm-hmm. you know it's it's a sharp stick, and you're throwing it while your heart rate's like 200 mile an hour. So it's not going to be exact every time, but. You know, Fortunately, on the bear, I did get one lung, but when that spear went in, he went to rolling and biting and fighting the spear, and and he threw a fit on the ground. I mean, it wasn't like he got hit and took off running. Instead, when he walked under me and I hammered him, he flipped over backwards, rolled and started biting at the spear. I have a camera on my, on my spear above the blades. You can see his huge head reach around and grab the hickory handle that's harder than the bones in your arms. And in one bite, he just bit down and snapped it in half. And then he rolled again and took off through the brush. And when he was leaving, bam, he ran right into my – I was in a tree and I was about six feet off the ground, my feet. I was – when he st- stood up when he first came in, he was looking over the tree stand at, at knee level to me. That's how big he was. But then when he finished and came down the trail and walked right into the slock zone – and I hammered him. He did all that rolling. Then he ran into my tree. Well, a lot of a uh, lot of the timber up in Alaska, especially along the salmon streams where we were hunting, it, you know, you're lucky to find a tree that's six inches around. And that's about what I was in, about a seven or eight inch tree. I had a lone, lone wolf climber. I had maneuvered it up high enough I could get off the ground to get out of his line of sight, made a squirrel nest under me. And the only hole I had was at the trail that they walk up and down to get to the salmon. And when he took off running, he ran into the tree and about knocked me out of the tree. Wow. I was so freaked out that I hit him and that he was dying in front of me that, oh my gosh, I've speared a bear. <laughs> it's happened. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm jacked up. I'm going like, to run through this wall right now. I feel like I just speared my own bear. <laughs> <laughs> but when he hit the tree, it shocked me enough to say, oh, I still have another spear. I grabbed the other spear. He ran un- into the forest right past me and then started rolling on the ground at about 15 yards. And I threw the other spear at him, but I missed. But, man, it was an epic experience, one that I'll die with a memory that will never fade in my mind because it was a rush. Do you have to have any kind of backup plan in case things go wrong on a Pistol. grizzly bear hunt? Yeah. Do you got a sidearm with you or how do you handle that? You know what? Um, whether I'm hunting dangerous game, Cape Buffalo in Africa, or maybe it's a, a, a brown bear, you know, um, uh, what's the point if you're going to go spear hunting and prove to yourself that you can kill the bear with a spear, what's the point of having a gun? You know, it's like, so you might as well go bow hunting and then shoot him and then maybe mm-hmm. blast him if he runs at you. But 
unfortunately, Alaska doesn't allow you uh, to hunt dangerous game uh, without a guide. So if he would have attacked, uh, my guide was about 60 yards in the brush. And uh, if the bear had got on me, knocked me out of my stand or whatever, a lot of days I was on the ground in ground blinds or I was spotting and stalking, trying to catch salmon in the streams or whatever. You know, the bear would get on you and you would definitely get hurt. Uh, you could get killed, but the odds of him killing you before the time your, your guide shoots him off you. And I had one of the best guides in the world and Casey Johnson's a badass. but, uh, to make a long story short, I spear hunt because I'm a spear hunter and I don't carry a pistol when I do it. So he's a real man. Yeah. <laughs> he is, Ask he is. Him another question. And, 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 and spearing. And, and I know you're interested in the atlatl and the, both, yeah. of, both of those are things that, I mean, you really got, I've, I've thrown a, th- a few at lateral darts, but it's only for novelty. Like I couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. It's amazing how effective they are and how far you can wing one of those. But tell us, like, how do you practice, how do you practice spear hunting and how do you practice throwing the at lateral to, to where you're good and proficient enough to hunt with it? Well, I have two different kinds of spears, one that's lighter for like whitetails and a smaller game. And then I have the heavy spears that I try to throw within really close proximity, like a Cape Buffalo, you know. So it depends what the scenario, what I'm practicing for. But it's just like anything, man. I'll crawl up on the roof of my house and put a paper plate on the ground and practice my <laughs> deer hunting skills with my, you know, with my spear. If you ever pick up a spear and stand in a tree and have a white tailed doe walk under you and you raise that spear, you will once again feel that feeling you felt when you were 10 years old, when that deer walked into you with your 30 out six, Mm -hmm. it's the greatest rush that a man can experience when that animal is so close and you raise that spear, you can actually feel the emotion from that deer. You can see the reflection on its eyes. You can smell it. It's breath sometimes. That's what real hunting is about to me. And it is a rush. And, you know, once it's in your veins, you'll never go back to, you know, you'll never quit. You know, I mean, I'll probably be throwing a wheel out of my wheelchair. I'll be throwing a spear <laughs> one day. What I've always admired about Tim was his passion. And you can tell, you know, just in the early goings here of this podcast, just how passionate he is no about what he does. And, you know, a few years back, back when Outdoor Channel and Sportsman's Channel was still doing the Golden Moose Awards and had an award show, Tim had won fan favorite. And I think it was my favorite speech I've ever heard anybody ever give at one of those award shows. And frankly, those award shows could be downright brutal to, yeah. to sit through yeah. and Tim's speech was so impassioned and so well thought out and, 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 and delivered and his passion that you could hear here in the interview. It just, mm-hmm. it goes through everything that Tim does and it's so authentic. And I think that's why people gravitate towards his videos on YouTube yep. and his Instagram channel and his TV show. Well, his pursuit, it, yeah. It, yeah. It's just, it's that passion you don't get with many people these days. Mm-mm. Yeah, I, I, hunting's about hunting to me. There's no other, there's no agenda behind that. Yeah, I pay my bills and I got my kids through college with doing television. But you know what? If they cancel my show next week because I'm too brutal and I get arrested and they say, hey, you know, this guy poached a swan in Mozambique, so he, you know, no longer we're gonna watch him or some crazy thing happens to me. At that point, I'm gonna keep hunting because that's what I do. You know, I mean, whether I've got a camera behind me or not, I a lot of times when I go hunting, I've got got my blow gun or my spear. That's what I love to do. But, you know, the one thing about spear hunting that I love, and if you think about it, for example, what if you live in Arizona and you love to hunt elk? Well, you might get to go elk hunting twice in your life if you've got a good area behind your house because you just can't get a tag, you know? Well, with with spear hunting, if the governments that control our fishing game would allow spear hunting, this is what it could do. They could issue... 20,000 spear hunting tags to Arizona residents that want to go elk hunting. There's guys like me and there's guys not like me that would still buy a spear tag just so that they can experience the hunt knowing darn well that their chances of killing a uh, an Arizona elk may be less than 2%. 
Guys draw archery tags every year to go to New Mexico to hunt the Florida mountains to hunt the ibex. Their odds are less than 5%. I think they're around 2% with a bow and arrow. But yet every year there's a huge waiting list to get those tags. It could be the same way with spear hunting all across the country for big game animals that no one ever gets to hunt. Maybe two or three times a lifetime in some situations. You could hunt mountain goats. You could hunt... You could hunt sheep. What that would do, it would it would create a ton of hunter experience. They would get the option to at least be in the woods when an elk is bugling to see a moose as he's coming to the call. The odds of spearing him would be a bit remote, but at least you're experiencing the hunt. You're putting money back into fishing game, which is a huge resource. And so why make a guy sit on his couch for you know, 10 years before he finally draws that coveted tag when you could hand out another 10,000 tags and only have a few elk taken and you don't hurt the resource. Spear hunting is very ethical. When that spear goes into the animal's eye spear, I don't care if I make a bad throw and it hits that animal in the hip or it sticks him in the neck. The, the trauma created by a spear is so beautiful that the animal dies in quick time. I just speared an elk this uh, last winter and in 24 seconds, the elk was stone dead laying on the ground. And that's generally the case. You can spear a 600 pound animal and they're toast. Unlike other weapons that we use, you back off, give them an hour, wait, wait, hopefully, oh, I've jumped them, follow them again. I have never, ever, being honest, when speared an animal that the spear hit him directly, mm -hmm. that he didn't die and die quick. So that brings my next question up. Some, something that you're infamous for is your spear hitting you. you. You had to climb out of your tree. It was in Africa and your spear fell out of the tree and hit you in the leg. How did you make it through that knowing what kind of trauma that those spears can do? Well, fortunately, that spear hit me in the thigh, which missed my face and all. But what happened is I was in the tree. I had uh, usually I film myself uh, on remote locations. If I'm white tail hunting from a tree stand or, you know, if I'm trying to spear animals, I use my GoPro setups all around my tree. And I usually get some pretty spectacular footage that way. That limits the amount of people and the odor and the movement and yeah, what now? But anyway, when I was in that tree, I dropped one of my GoPros out and it tumbled down and fell into the, the bait I was using to hunt Eland. And I'm like, oh, man, drop my camera. So African animals are unique uniquely different than North American. And I mean, if they see a camera on the ground or whatever, just even if it's a GoPro, they pick up on that immediately. And so I had to go down and get my camera. Well, I never thought about it, but I had my spear tucked in there beside me uh, with the point sticking on a limb. I always use gravity to hold my spear in place. Mm -hmm. So it was sticking on a little limb like this. And uh, I forgot to secure my spear and down the tree I went. And I didn't have a tree stand or a ladder or anything like that. I just, I scale the trees and sit on the limbs a lot of times in Africa. But I was halfway down this tree when I slipped on one of the tree limbs and I jerked the tree. And when I did, I jerked that spear free. Uh. And that spear came down and hit my hat, went right in front of my nose and came down and went plumb through my thigh. So there I was halfway in the tree with my spear sticking out of my thigh and I could see the blood oozing out the sides of it, but it was in there pretty stiff. So, you know, at the moment I didn't realize I, when you first get speared or I imagine if you get shot or shot with an arrow or something, the moment that it happens, the first thing your mind does, it tries to register what has just happened. Yep. And I was like trying to register to myself, Oh my God, I've speared myself. <laughs> and as I looked at the spear, it dawned on me that, oh, I'm still in the tree. <laughs> and then when I started to go down the tree, I could feel the blades in there. And then when I did, the spear kind of tilted and started to fall to the side. And I knew what that meant. So I grabbed the spear with one hand and I held on and I looked. And then I started to come into my senses. I like, my radio was above me eight feet. And the ground was eight feet below me. So I thought, I'm going to try to get the camp, uh, get up the tree where I can get my uh, radio. 
Well, I took one step. And when I did that blood shot out, cause I oozed the camera or the spear to the side and the, and the blood shot out of it and spurted up on my face. So I knew I had nicked my artery in my leg, but it was very bad situation. There was a hook on my spear so that when I speared the animals, it, it, it stayed in them and, and cut them even worse. And, and the camera would capture their retreat and I could document the amount of seconds that go by to kill them. Well, now I was documenting the amount of seconds that I was going to kill myself. The only problem was I forgot to turn the camera on. <laughs> so anyway, when I grabbed the, the spear, I knew I had to push it on through so I could pull it out the other side. But when I started to push it out the bottom, it was so painful. I was worried that I couldn't stop the blood if I ran it out the bottom. Yeah. So then I decided I had to pull it out. Well, when I went to pull it out, I couldn't pull it out because I had hooks on it. <sighs> So then I tried to crawl down the tree and then I couldn't crawl down the tree. And then I felt myself wanting to fall asleep because I was going in shock. So at that point, I said, man, I got to get this spear out. So I just gripped my teeth and ripped it back out this little way it came in. And that's that's when the blood really started. And I looked up the tree uh, at that moment. I don't know why, but I chose to go down and get on the ground as quick as I could. So I got down on the ground. I started to hold the, the, the wound closed. It wouldn't stop bleeding. I tried to get my pants off to rip rip my pants. They were stuck on my boots. The blood was coming so fast. I was feeling weak. I was tired. I wanted to close my eyes. I knew I was going to die. So the only ha- option I had at that point was take my middle two fingers and shove them as deep as I could in the hole until I could feel that little squirt. And it feels just like it feels just like a little pipe that is squirting blood you can feel it it's like water but it's hot and you and i found that and i closed it and when i closed it i just tried to maintain my my composure and not fall asleep holding your own artery shut yeah when you get hurt like that you're so thirsty you want water so bad it's crazy i mean i've seen it in the movies and platoon and everything you they depict that moment where you're you're losing blood and your body instantly goes into shock and says, give me water. It's true. You feel that your tongue wrinkles up and you want water so bad. But anyway, I knew I was in trouble. I held it. I said to myself, let's just get through this next 10 minutes and get through the, the, you know, the shock. And if I can beat shock, I'll, I'll beat this thing. And finally shock went away. I pulled my hand out and the blood kept coming. So I put it back in there after about 45 minutes. It finally quit, uh, quit to the point where I could at least pull my hand out. And at that point, I thought, well, heck, I've gone this far. I might as well turn on my camera. And that's what you see uh, me in Africa laying uh, with war dogs walking around me smelling my blood. <laughs> but oh my not anyway, a good place to be bleeding out. Great story, man. It was great. I lived through it <laughs> that night when they come looking for me. They wondered why I hadn't radioed. They found me. All right. I had slocked myself. How long were wow. you sitting there? I don't know, because I don't know what point in the day that I had speared myself, but it was early on when I was first getting ready. So quite a while. I mean, I probably was there five or six hours. But man, I'll tell you what, that water they gave me when I was laying under that tree was awesome. Mm. So at that point, you're you're in a pretty remote area of the world, you know. So how do they get you to treatment or or how do you get treatment to to, because you got a major wound, obviously. Yeah. So that the, the danger just began at that point a blood blood transfusion at that point in time in south africa was as dangerous as sparing yourself yeah yeah and so i opted said no i don't want that they uh, the doctor that i was with um you know saved my life but he almost killed me um he gave me some drugs that were would kill infection in africa like None other. And that was what saved me. But what he didn't do was clean the wound. That spear that I just killed that animal with had killed two warthogs, an impala and a gims buck. And the blood was still on that poop and mud and everything else. I had just taken the blade and, and resharpened it, but not worried about cleaning my spear. I had no idea it was going to be in my body. So that had gone through my leg. And I guess if I'd have been back in the States, they'd have run a tube inside the wound and flushed it out with a fluid and cleaned me. But there was hair and mud and everything else. So I do remember the doctor. He washed it off on top and washed it off on bottom. And then he sewed me shut. So when I stepped off the plane 24 hours later in, in the United States, my leg was black. 
And, uh, but my doctor said, you know, there's no going in there and fixing it. Now it's all through your leg. Now it's just a fight. We got to win, but the, the medicine that he gave me had, had did its job. And then with the medicine I got from my, my doctor, when I got home, probably saved my leg. Now, when it gets cold outside, when you're in the tree stand and it's 20 below, you know, if I'm wolf hunting or something, my leg will go to sleep first. You know, that foot will start to tingle. But outside of that, man, I don't have any problems. And I, I just got to say, I must have got lucky. There must be a bigger plan for me than dying in Africa. <sighs> I'd say, man, crazy. it's unbelievable. It it, and people but. should Google this on, on your YouTube page mm-hmm. or go to your YouTube page. <laughs> Tim Wells, it's unbelievable. It's It's just crazy to, to watch your experience and you documenting your experience when you're sitting there against that tree. It's unbelievable. Some serious willpower. Yeah. It's, it's been a while, but did you cut a video of you killing a dove with a blow gun while you were recovering from that? Seemed like you were like laid up in a wheelchair or something and still had to kill something. No, that was, uh, that was probably a rumor. I had, I didn't plan on killing anything else at that moment when I was laying there bleeding to death. No, once you got back, yeah, yeah. Once you got back. on that same show though, you probably saw me shoot a dove with my blow gun. Yeah. I did a lot of blow gun hunting in Africa. Africa is a target rich environment. As anybody knows, mm-hmm. it's been there. There's monkeys and warthogs and constant, uh, interaction with wildlife when you're sitting at the water holes. And, uh, it's a plethora of, of fun and hunting, you know, uh, Africa is a the testament to hunting and the financial resource that hunters bring to Africa. In the locations where you can hunt in South Africa, much of which is high fence, but vast areas, maybe 10, 20,000 acres under high fence, where these hunters come, they spend upwards of five to a hundred thousand dollars per visit. That money brings money into the resource. And so these locations where hunting is legal and where people do it, there is a plethora of game. It's just, it just proves how hunting, even though we are killing animals, we are providing life for ultimately the, in the, all the other species in the area that we're hunting. Now you step outside these locations where you're allowed to hunt and you get onto another farm or another ranch in South Africa, for example, where hunting's not allowed, you can sit at a water hole there all day. And the only thing that you're going to see come in is maybe a cow. It's because they have killed all the animals. They compete with their livestock and there's no money or no monitor no, no value in that animal. So, uh, Africa is a great place. If you want to test out your spear hunting or your, uh, blowgun hunting, it's a good place. I spear now in Mozambique because the liberals have filtered into Africa and they have made spear hunting illegal there for no reason. There's only one or two spear hunters in the world that are proficient at it. And all these places that make spear hunting illegal, like these cowards in Alberta who are run by a, a freak of a, of a president up there that knows nothing about wildlife or hunting. And he is a background that he's a coward. He made hunting illegal up there with a spear. It's the origin of where the Indians ran Buffalo over the cliffs and smashed their heads in so they could collect their game. They speared thousands. His own ancestors survived. And he's here today because they chucked spears of woolly mammoth and killed the saber toothed tiger. And now he thinks he's going to make it illegal in Alberta because some poor sob shot spirit of a bear and put it on YouTube and the whole world lost their mind when he picked up a piece of its intestine. It's a sad case that we're in right now. And we have to stand up for our rights. They can take my spear hunting, but they're going to take your bow and arrow someday. If you don't stand up for what's right. And it pisses me off. Spear hunting seems like a weird place to start. If you're going to start peeling away at hunter rights, rights, because it's such a low percentage. I mean, you talk about the purest form of getting in on an animal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because the, it's the lo- probably the lowest percentage, but yet it, it to an outsider looking in might seem like the most uh, brutal, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, and you've, yeah. as you started the show out saying it, it's actually the quickest and you're, you're kind of, it sounds like your mission and the videos that you showcase, it's, it's to showcase how humane and how quick they actually do die because yeah, of right. You know what? 
I shot a coos whitetail 120 yards with my bow and arrow. And I was assaulted on that one by some anti hunters. Usually they're people that know nothing about hunting, but you know, saying, Oh, it's not fair shooting long distance like that. Well, that's the same guy that will jump on my jump on me a, a week later and say, that's too brutal. You shouldn't be spear hunting. Which is it? Do I need to shoot him with a knot six or can I spear him? Which is it? You know, spear hunting, there's nothing you can say about spear hunting that is, that will tear it down. For example, if you spear an animal, I have proven, and so is my the, my friends that spear hunt, that spear hunting is ethical, it's quick, and it's fair chase. If you want to hunt wild animals and you want them to get away from a hunter, you better hope he's spear hunting because nine times out of ten, they don't even get close enough to try. And then when they're close enough, you still got to raise your spear and throw it before they get out of the way. Mm -hmm. If the spear hits them, they're dead. But they've got fair chase, man. You've got to get five, ten yards, maybe 15 if you're really good at it. So uh, I'm an advocate for spear hunting, atlatls, blow gunning. All these primitive methods, they don't hurt our resource. They All they do is help it. They influx more people into the activity of being outside, seeing animals, inter interacting with conservation, you know, spending their money on the, the sport of hunting. And uh, very few animals get killed just because it's hard to get close to them. And hardly any animals get wounded because when it finally comes down and you finally make it happen, they die quickly. It's an ethical hunt. And a day later, you're eating their loins. Tim, Tim do you mind talking about what an atlatl is for folks that are listening and they, they maybe have never heard of it? An atlatl is basically a glorified spear, if you ask me. Uh, it's a spear, a long arrow that's pretty heavy, and you can use a really big broadhead on that thing. And then it's you've got a handle that basically propels the arrow with a notch that on the end of it. It's a long stick. The Indians used it. They put a notch at the end of the stick, and the end of your arrow can be hollow, for example. That arrow goes into that notch, and you hold the stick like this. When the animal comes in, you pull back like this, the arrow's sticking way out in front of you. Remember, an arrow, like if you're shooting instinctively, or a spear, or an atlatl, the longer the shaft on the on the, the spear or the arrow, the easier it is to kill with it. It's like shooting a pistol at a target out there, shoot it at the golf ball with your pistol, or use your 22 rifle with a long barrel. The longer the barrel, the longer the shaft, the easier it is to instinctively shoot. That's why when I bow hunt, I use 31 inches when I could be using 28. But it gives me a better sight down my arrow. But anyway, that's what the atlatl is. And when that animal comes in there, you use that rod to propel that arrow three times as fast as you could actually throw it. So when you throw it forward, that lever that is attached to the arrow whips that 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 arrow and, and they're really accurate. They've got big fletchings on them and they they fly well. And I know some guys are really good. at. I hunted with the in uh, when I was in uh, uh, Australia, I hunted on the coastline with Aborigines and man, they could take out a oh. kangaroo at 50 yards pretty proficiently. It was so much fun. We took them down to the uh, the coastline, and I spent a day throwing atlatls with them, and uh, finally got to go hunting. And I watched them pick off those uh, kangaroos. It was so freaking awesome. Uh, <laughs> I never did really get a kangaroo, but man, it was sure fun trying. So, say somebody wants to start getting into this this part of hunting, this sport. What, where where would you begin? What do you need to know, or, or what you know? Where would you go to get the equipment? maybe the coaching, you know, where do you start? Well, the interesting thing about that is you could go to my charity and see, we have a charity at slockmaster.com. It's for the Tim Wells foundation to make Tim more money. So you go to the slockmaster. <laughs> <It's 501c3. laughs> Flockmaster.com. You can get blow guns, razor darts. You can get my spears. You can get it all. And then when you get them, the easiest way to watch hunting or see it is to just go on YouTube and spend 
you know, a few hours and watch all my spear kills. You're going to get all these different angles. Nothing's fake. It's all real. And it will show me interacting with the animals and just watching will show you a lot about how to spear, when to move, when not to move. And you'll notice, Mm -hmm. holy crap, look how slow he's moving, trying to get into position to kill. You know, you watch a, a bow hunting video, you see a guy go like this and he draws his bow back and he pivots around. He turns back to his cameraman and says, you ready? You got the shot. Okay, here it goes. You try that spear hunting. When that thing's in there at three and a half, four yards, that'll never happen. So it's all about moving slow. It's about being a hunter. It's about stalking your prey and pouncing at the right moment when that animal turns its head. When something happens and the breeze blows, that animal will raise his head. He'll look around. That's what animals do when they're feeding or that's what they do when they're nervous. Mm-hmm. They're looking. They're constantly looking for natural predators that can get within that tight zone around them. You have to read their eyes. You listen and you watch as they come in and you speak. You pounce at the moment that they're, they put their head into the bait or they turn and look at their friend or a, something alarms them and they look away from you. You're constantly looking at their eyes because their peripheral vision, if, whether you're above them or beside them, will beat you every time if you throw at the wrong moment. So it's, it's an intense, but yet extremely rewarding thing to kill an animal with a spear. I hunted the, uh, Audad for over 15 years now I've hunted them. And finally, this year, finally, I had a, a big odd ad come under my stand. For 15 years, I would go sometimes two or three times a year. I would go to South Texas. I would hunt the wild odd ad in the, down by Rock Springs or uh, Del Rio. These areas where there's a lot of them, but yet they're, you know, they live in some of the harshest environment in North America. I'd hunt them on pinch pet points. I'd try to hunt them on water holes. I'd try to hunt them on bait. These guys would come in to the tree stand and they would get to within 10 yards of me, sometimes 15, marching with the wind in my face that are coming straight at me down the trail I had planned it out on. They would get to that moment where they're almost in spear range and lock up and stare at the bait. Those odd ad would stand and stare sometimes for 20, 30 minutes. Oh. They would stare so long. I would turn the cameras off because I was running out of hard drive on my GoPros. Yeah. And then with the wind being perfect, me being high in the tree, they never look up. They turn and leave, even though they're hungry or either they want to drink or they want to come down that trail. They had a sixth sense. There was something about it. Finally, this year, I was out on my tree stand and at pouring down rain. I had rain gear on with my Masio camouflage over the top of it. A torrential downpour was coming down on it. It did something to the Audad. It tricked him. The big ram came down the trail. I had put corn under my stand and I'd found on my trail cams. He had hit it two days before. I was wanting to get out of the stand because I was saturated in water wet. But the the reason I killed was because I waited it out in that rain. It did something to his sixth sense. The electric current or whatever it is that gives you away, he couldn't feel it that day. He came into 15 yards and locked up and stood and looked at the bait. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. He's going to turn and leave. And for no reason, he just walked right in and started feeding. And I slocked him. The spear went down through the top of it between his shoulder blades, went through his heart and stuck out the bottom of his brisket. He ran a big horseshoe bucking like a wild bull. And as he ran into the forest, he died 30 seconds later in a heat just in in an eye shot and i walked over there and when i pulled his his horns above the ground and i turned him around the blood was oozing out the side of his mouth he was mine i had finally after all that time i had speared the beast but the time before between then and now when i finally held that giant monster in my hand i could have killed at least 30 of them with my bow and arrow Mm -hmm. so the resource but the experience was wonderful. I had got what I came for. It had taken me years, but it afforded the animals life. And I got to play the game, even though I never killed them. But it was wonderful without killing them because finally it happened. And if it hadn't it happened, it didn't matter. I'll still come back. I would be there this year again in the tree trying to make it happen. Experience it's, is awesome. It sounds a lot like trapping in that it makes you a better bow hunter or gun hunter if you're going to if you're going to get into primitive hunting. 
I, yeah. I, you know, I trapped as a kid and it's discouraging and frustrating when you first start. You can't figure out how did he figure it out? Because a lot of times you think like, a, how can I trick like like their mind is like a human, you know, and, and when you get to the point where you're trapping animals, trying to trick them at what they're best at, uh, it's very difficult. And you have to be a new level of person, uh, uh, of predator when you're in the forest. And that's what I like about predator hunting. You know, that's what I like about spear hunting and blowgun hunting and trapping. Those are the, the real, those, that's the real deal. That's where when you do it, you are a different hunter than the vast majority of people that are hunting because you have mastered the game of killing and getting close. Well, I'd say you're as close to being as our ancestors were as possible. That yeah. is. He's a modern Neolithic man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so when you're getting your setups, which do you prefer? Do you prefer having that elevation and getting them below you to, to make the shot? Or do you prefer being on the ground and, and having a, you know, a broadside, you know, eye level type shot? Well, it depends the prey you're after. Obviously, you know, whitetails, it's best to be high in the tree. But then you have to be really accurate. So you can't get too high because you might miss. Uh, and you have to be careful what you wear. If you wear something that's a little noisy that you could use when you're bow hunting, they hear that at the moment. You, if there's anything in your armpit that will make a no, noise when you throw, they're gone by the time the spear even gets there. Your spear's traveling about you know, 30 feet, 40 feet per second. So you don't, they've got all the time in the world if they know it's coming. So I like to be high for white tails, but if I'm spearing dangerous game, I want to be right in his face. I want to be right there where I can throw hard. And if he hears it, it's still too late. I want to be able to drive that spear through big ribs, you know, like a Cape Buffalo He's almost too thick up there through the, the loin area. So I want to be on the ground where I can hammer him through the rib cage or directly in the paunch where I can run that spear up in the, into the intestinal tract. You know, so it's all relative. Now, mule deer hunting, unfortunately, Alberta has kept me from doing it, but I know I would have killed one. The year that they made it illegal was the year I was going to spear a big you know, mule deer, because they let you walk right up to them in the fields. I mean, we've seen numerous people walk up and shoot them with their bow straight down. So spearing would have been a, a no brainer up there. Maybe it'd take me a few years, but I would have got it done. So every animal is different. And when I go to Africa, I love to spear on the ground because there's bush pigs, there's warthogs, and there's multiple animals where if you scare one away days later, you may get the chance. I went Cape Buffalo hunting and it was my first chance, but it took, it took me 22 days, but I got one on the 22nd day. It was a huge Duggar bull for 10 days. I had hunted in Mozambique out in the grasslands and the big herds and I would get in tight, but I could not pick the big bulls out of the herds. Obviously there's no way to bait them out there or trees because it's vast grass longs around the open rivers where the crocs and the lions hunt and everything. So 22 days into it, I'm taking a break of all things back in the forest that lines the grassland. I'm searching for Elon that day. And by chance, it was a bonus. We came upon the largest buffalo we had seen the whole trip, and I'd blast a thousand buffaloes. It was what they call an old Duggar bull. He was so old that he's been kicked out of the herd, or he just left the herd because he's not horny anymore. So he goes to the forest where he feels uh, content being alone, and they're grouchy and they're mean. A lot of times their horns are wore down, but this guy's wasn't. They were huge, black and brown. We crossed his tracks when we were when we were looking for Elon. And the, the, I could tell by the emotion of my trackers and the pH that they were excited. This was a huge buffalo. So we got on the track literally in the forest of Mozambique. They will track the buffalo down and find it. It's sandy. They're amazing trackers. So the pursuit of that buffalo just the, the hours prior to spearing that buffalo was was so intense and exciting as I followed the trackers through the timber and they would follow the track and they'd look ahead and you could tell they were nervous and it was, it was invigorating. I mean, it was so fun. And then finally we found the Buffalo at high noon and he was crossing a, a little meadow in the forest. 
he crossed the meadow and so we stayed behind him and he lost us a few times but we stayed on the track and finally about one in the afternoon we came upon the the big cape buffalo and he was asleep uh well he, he was bedded he wasn't asleep actually and he was about 50 yards ahead of us through a wall of brush. And as we looked at him, I had a nice breeze in my face. I took my shoes off and I'll never forget my pH saying, he's a giant bull. Shoot it with your bow. Take your bow. Take your bow. They had no faith in me whatsoever. And I had waited my lifetime to do it. It was a $25,000 hunt and I had invested time and money in this thing. I wasn't going to put the dang spear down and grab my bow at that point. I was like, you know what? And I looked at my outfitter and I said, he's a wonderful bull. He's probably going to get away, but I have to try. So I took my spear. I got my, my shoes off and I made my way in. And at seven yards, the bull was still chewing his cut. I could see the flies and he'd flip his ear. So I knew he was alive, but I had lined up two trees right in front of his eyes. And I moved like a snail behind those trees, constantly trying to watch his face. So when his eye would blink or whatever, I knew that he was looking. So I just continued to monitor his face. And as I got to within five yards, there was a little piece of brush in my way. And I knew if I stepped into that brush or if I twitched it wrong, it would make a noise and the deal would be over. I had to go around that piece of brush. But to do that, I had to step outside my block of two trees where it would be and I would be in his vision. But it was meant to be because as I stood there, it seemed like a, a turning the pass. But suddenly the wind kicked up just a little bit, a slight breeze. And, the, and I could hear the dead foliage on the ground. It was winter that time. You could hear the, the leaves blowing. In the, and at that moment, the bull turned and looked to his side. And when he did, he looked away. It was at that moment I said, it's now or never. I made quick, two quick steps to the side onto the sand around a little the piece of brush and back into his away from his line of sight in the trees. And in the moment it took me to do that and get back, he looked back and missed me. At that point, I raised the spear. And when it when I could see the actual shaft of the spear and the point of the spear inches in front of my face, I knew that my lifelong dream was about to go down and that one of us was about to die. It was the rush of a lifetime. And when that spear hit that bull, it popped the front rib and I could hear that crack and the distinct whack of that spear as it thudded into the opposite rib cage. He came to his feet. He jerked his head left and right looking for whatever had hit him. He's looking for hyenas or lions, but it was me, the one poor buffalo in all of Africa that just got speared. He was the most unluckiest buffalo in the world and I was the luckiest man on the planet. He's looking for me. I'm holding still behind the trees hoping he doesn't spot me and then he turned and ran the plan was to shoot the buffalo if i wounded one but as he ran across there i could see the porridge coming out he was slocked right through the gizzard and i screamed at my guy don't shoot he's dead and sure enough <laughs> 20 minutes later and we were standing over the greatest trophy of my life i have to imagine the ph and the guy were like he's He's this doing it. Craziest, like he's actually doing it. Craziest white guy from America <laughs> right. I've ever met. <laughs> it's his twenty five thousand dollars if he wants to. If you get a chance to watch that video on YouTube. I think the most compelling moment to be a spear hunter is the end. Not so much that I snuck up and killed him, but the end when you can see in the tracker's face and the pH when they're just looking at the animal and looking at each other. It was like they didn't even know I was there at that point or they didn't even care. It was like they had done it. They had taken a white man in there and yeah. speared an animal and they had guided him. And they will be known for the rest of time, the one outfitter and PH and the tracker that took a white guy with a sharp stick and got it done. You know, if you want to go kill something with a, a you know, a high powered rifle, I would book a hunt with a guy that took a guy with a spear. I would feel most confident in that. <laughs> That's right. Well, just, just take, just attempting to take a Cape Buffalo with a bow is crazy in and of itself. I mean, they, they were probably looking at you side, sideways, like you're really going to try to take one of these with a bow, but you're like, well, actually I want to try to spear one. <laughs> yeah. How did that conversation <laughs> five go? Yards. Yeah. Well, actually they knew before I came because you would be amazed. There's 
how many outfitters there are in the world. And I'm not dishing on outfitters in general. I'm just saying in general, they're in it for the money. They're in it for the quick kill, a lot of them. And then there's the other guys that are in it because they're in it for the love of the game. They're in it for the hunt. They're in it because that's what they did when they were a kid and they still do it now. Unfortunately, they got to charge their friends to go do it. Those are the guys that I usually hunt with. Same with hunting the the grizzly bear. I ran into several cowards in Alaska that are he-man bear hunters. But when they thought I was going to spear one, they were scared. But Casey took me. And the same it was in Mozambique. I had to go through numerous outfitters for I found someone that had the balls to take me. And uh, it paid off big time. It was awesome. And now we're good friends. And he still rips on me at least once a year. On <laughs> there or some of talks, you know, it's always about the spear in the leg. But after that, you know, sure, we're, sure. <laughs> oh, that old story. <laughs> Bring that up again. I think just walking through the Mozambique jungle barefoot is yeah. is an accomplishment in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. So, is yeah. there anything left on your bucket list? You mentioned the mule deer. Is there anything that that you know you, you got the grizzly? Is there anything left that you really well, need? I, to- I, I want to spear a grizzly. I mean, I want to spear a, a mule deer, and I can maybe do that in, in Nebraska, Western Nebraska, somewhere if I can find the right place where someone will let me try where the where the deer you know uh, going to come through pinch points, or I can catch them in the fields where they're sleeping midday. You know, I want to do that, but. Uh, Man, I am so fortunate to have the family that I do. And my 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 son and daughter are just absorbed in college. And it's been a, a stressful for me because uh, they're Clint is a an amazing athlete. He, he's a baseball player. He plays for ISU. And, you know, his his goal is to, you know, become a doctor and play professional baseball, perhaps. So you can imagine how much time he has to spend and he doesn't get to hunt with me. So my bucket list is converted to taking Sydney and Clint hunting. And, uh, when they, when they slow down and, and they get weeks off where their time's not consumed, then that's where I'll spend the rest of my life with my family hunting. Uh, but in terms of what I needed to do to prove to myself that I'm a hunter and enjoy, uh, I've always wanted to spear a lion and I've, I think politics is going to keep me from that, uh, but maybe someday they'll make a, uh, an exception and let me spear one and give me a permit to do it. But until then, I think my bucket list is pretty f- fulfilled, and now I'm just uh, living the life that God gave me and enjoying it and doing what I do best, and that's hunt and make TV shows and YouTube clips and stupid podcasts with pregnant girls. That's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not this one, hey, by yeah. the way. No, it's not. Some other awesome show. Where yeah, none of us are pregnant here. <laughs> well, I'll just be clear about that. <laughs> well, uh, Tim, thanks so much for joining us. So yes. We, uh, we got to have him back and talk Absolutely. more stories. I, I could listen to him. He, I, could, I don't know if you have an audio book out, but you should have an audio book. No because doubt. the passion that you have, it really exudes in all, all forms of, of media. So I think that's a... That's something you should look into. And this may be the first and last podcast that Tay joins us on because we were talking about holding your own artery shut. And yeah. yeah. It's- <laughs> I feel like my life is boring now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tim kind of takes things to a totally new level. Yeah. Makes you yeah. consider your own life. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, we've, we've, we've I, I know. was a little boy coming home from, uh, from kindergarten and first grade. You know, I had no friends where I lived. We lived in a modular home with a, a block trailer or a, a basement underneath it. We were a poor family, but my best friend was waiting for me when I get off the bus. I would run that mile down that dusty dirt road, run inside the house because I knew I only had about an hour left before it got dark. Grab that recurve that my grandpa built for me, the five wooden arrows and with the uh, steel tin roof points on the front of them with rooster feathers on the back, <laughs> run out into the cornfield and stand below the red winged blackbirds as they migrated across the sky headed for the river to roost and shoot arrow after arrow after arrow after arrow for thousands of repetitions until once in a while I would break a wing or hit a, a bird in the neck. And, you know, that engraved and in, in set in my life that made me a hunter. And, you know, I'm so thankful that I've gone down that road and it's brought me to this point in my life where I can finally say that, you know, life is good and that 
it all was for a reason. Even as I was little in sixth grade, my sixth grade teacher, even though it doesn't seem like much at the time, it was very traumatizing for me. She was talking to me at the time I had failed a test. And she said, if you don't stop chasing rats and the other animals in the woods, you're going to end up a no good for nothing. Wow. Well, she was wrong. Yeah. I know Mark and Terry and all of us, we've always admired uh, what you've done and, and um, the, the, just in general, the career that you've put together and more importantly, the person you are. And we appreciate the friendship outside of uh, just the respect we have as far as another person inside our industry. Well, I appreciate you guys and I love what you do. And, and uh, I think we're on the same team. I can see it in your faces and I see it on your shows. And, you know, we're just out there trying to have fun and entertain people and educate people and protect what we love the most. And, and uh, as a, a unit together and as a family of television hosts and and hunters, we have uh, a lot on our shoulders and we have a lot of challenges that face us now. And we have a lot of people that don't like us and the people that like us. Uh, we have a lot of responsibility to, to to move forward and do a good job and protect hunting and, and bring conservation into America and to the world. So uh, it's not something I take lighthearted either. And uh, I know that it's my responsibility to do a good job and be ethical but yet at the same time, still live my dream and, and get out there and do what God meant me to do. And I think we're doing a good job of it. I hope we don't fail. I hope we don't let our, 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 our friends and family and, you know, the people that like to watch us down. And we have to be cognizant of that as we get older. Yep. Well yep. said. Amen Absolutely. Well yeah. said. Well, we should probably end there. If folks want to join the show um, and uh, submit a question, just go to dreoutdoors.com slash podcast and leave us a voicemail there. We'll do our best to get that on the air. And you can watch the show on DeerCast. You can listen to the show anywhere you can find podcasts. As yeah. always, check out DeerCast. We are giving away the farm, 60 acres, Putnam County, Missouri. You want to check it out. So uh, all you got to do is click on the farm giveaway tab and Put in your email address, your name, and you're automatically minute. entered. Less yeah. than a minute. So, uh, me at flockmaster.com. That's right. <laughs> Tim, give us a plug on all your stuff there, YouTube channel, social channels, and uh, website. Yeah, that's that's I I put it all right there on slockmaster.com. That way they can click and go on anything they want to do. You want to see my YouTube channel, you want to be my friend, click up and hit me on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, if you want to tell me what kind of schmuck I am, we even got a department for that. Wow. <laughs> and, and you're the head of it, right? <laughs> all complaints yeah, go right to the top. To all the schmuck questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, th- thank yeah. you so much, Tim. We appreciate your Thanks. time today and uh, look forward to having you back on good luck this season buddy yeah appreciate you guys thanks for having me all All right right. thank you see you till next time peace out we're adding new videos every week so make sure to click that subscribe button and check out all of our amazing content this episode of dod tv is brought to you by onyx hunt the nation's number one gps hunting app 